to look over anything. So, and if anybody has any concerns or changes they'd like to make, please state them now. Chair Cronin, this is um, Commissioner Huxford. I didn't see any um, change or uh, add additions or edits. So I will make the motion that we move the minutes as stated. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. All right, next we're on to the discussion items. And with that, I'm gonna pass it on to Planner Needham regarding the uh, a briefing on the introduction to short-term rentals. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm just going to give a really quick um, briefing, um, kind of an introduction on the short-term rental code amendment. And I'm going to share my screen here. I did prepare a brief presentation tonight. Okay. Can everyone see that? Yep. Perfect. Okay. Um, so, Although the code uses the term tourist homes, I will be referring to them as short-term rentals or STRs for short. Um, this is the industry standard term um, and it's the term MRSC uses as well. So oftentimes short-term rentals are used by business people, students, traveling nurses um, that may not fit the definition of tourists. So this term better describes the use rather than the user. Um, I'm going to change the slide here. Whoops. Went too far. Okay. So um, for our existing code, um, I just want to take a moment and go over some of the highlights. Um, it's also attached to attachment one of your packet. So the definition of a tourist home is a single family structure rented by the day or week. And we have interpreted this to mean that the minimum rental period shall be considered um, 30 days. So only one is allowed per site and the single family external appearance must be maintained. Um, the owner also has to live on site. So only rooms within the home or ADUs may be rented out. Um, maximum of five rooms can be rented and the stays are limited to 10 consecutive days for a total of 30 calendar days in one year. Um, and the approval process that we use is an ACP or an administrative conditional use permit. Um, with some public notice that is required. Um, so on this slide, you'll see a map. Um, it's just a screen capture I took from Airbnb. Um, it's not showing quite all of them, but it's showing a good sum of them. You do have to zoom in to see all of them. Um, so however, um, according to the ever popular Home share website, Airbnb, there are about 20 to 25 operating in Lake Stevens that I found. Um, about one third of them um, are, appear to be single family homes. Um, and as you can see, most of them are on or near the lake. Only one of them was permitted and that was back in 2018. We haven't received any other applications since then. Um, and so although there are quite a few operating without permits, we do execute code enforcement on a complaint basis. And I would guess we've received a couple of complaints over the past two years and we worked with those owners to convert them into long-term rentals that are then rented on a monthly basis instead. And so it's not only us that is experiencing this rapid increase in the number of short-term rentals. Um, so since its founding in 2008, Airbnb has exploded in growth. Um, that's one of the biggest players in the short-term rental game, um, our Airbnb and then also VRBO or Verbo. And I would assume that Verbo's growth also mirrors that graph. Um, but recently, these platforms have allowed real estate investors to purchase entire homes and use them exclusively as short-term rentals. And unfortunately, many zoning codes are pretty antiquated and they don't address this new market that's emerging. Um, so many commonly only refer to bed, bed and breakfast rooms within a home instead of the entire home. Um, and most rentals don't even breakfast. 
Um, so some of the cities have begun updating their zoning codes in response. Most of the cities that I've seen that have updated their zoning codes are large cities such as Everett um, or popular travel destinations such as Chelan, Langley, um, those sorts of places. And so finally, why do we want to regulate SCRs or short-term rentals? Um, so in essence, most cities have worked really hard to regulate short-term rentals to level the playing field for all lodging, such as hotels and motels as well. Um, oftentimes these unpermitted short-term rentals operate without a business license and therefore lodging taxes um, are not being properly remitted to the state. Um, they can also cause issues with traffic, noise, parking. Um, and in my experience, these seem to be common to the entire homes that are being rented out. Um, and then hotels and motels must also comply with life safety standards, such as the egress requirements for egress windows and doors. Um, so some cities are requiring inspections prior to approving the short-term rental application, just to level that playing field again. Um, and then finally, there can be issues with long-term affordable housing supply and therefore housing affordability can be impacted. And so our next steps, um, we are proposing to form an ad hoc committee for the purpose of this code amendment. And we're also considering forming a focus group um, or industry groups if the commission is comfortable with that. Um, again, we are still at the very beginning of this process with this amendment. So project scope and schedule will be coming out soon, probably in January. So with that, are there any questions for me before we move on to the discussion questions listed in the Slack report? Do, do any uh, commissioners have any questions for Planner Needham? I'll withhold mine, thanks, at this time. Yeah, Planner Needham, I think you can go into those questions and I assume we'll all have kind of double up with the questions you're about to ask. Yeah, excellent. So they are in your packet. Let me go ahead and navigate to that real fast. Okay, so first question, um, would the commissioners be comfortable with the formation of a committee and or would they like to the city to split public input through different methods such as industry groups or focus groups? I have a, a comment on that. Um, I think we've had good luck in the past when we've had committees um, of stakeholders, um, but I, I, I feel a little bit of hesitancy towards having an industry only um, group looking at this. I think having industry representation might be helpful on a stakeholder community committee just to get an idea of what kind of the standards are within the industry to make it even a, a profitable endeavor to have a home like this. Um, but I would, I, in my, my personal preference would be to, to really focus on making sure that the, the participants in the committee are, are stakeholders in our community. I'll chime in real quick and say, um, I don't support a committee at all. Uh, that's what the planning commission is for, in my opinion. And I really, I mean, I think it's, I see all the questions here that we're going to be going over. And I think it's a little bit more simpler than what it looks like here. I mean, there's a lot of existing ordinances around the state of Washington that we could easily throw our stuff into and call it a day. This is, to me, a two meeting issue at max. So I would not support a committee at all. Personally, I think that's what we're here to do. That's what our job is. Thank you both. Do any other commissioners have any comments? If I, if I may, Chair. Um, Jill, I appreciate this conversation. It's going to be interesting because you're dealing with land use rights versus um, you know, the people that need to live next to that. For the record, I have nothing to put on Airbnb. Got nothing. But I have a real hard time um, if the next door neighbor from me is going to be um, doing this. So um, instead of doing a um, committee, which I agree with um, Commissioner Welch, uh, muddies the water. 
I would suggest that you go to other cities. You named a couple. Manson specifically um, did a committee, did an advisory committee, and got into a, a situation where they were pulling um, a lottery, and then they had a certain amount of insurance that the person had to carry, blah, blah, blah. It went down a rabbit hole quick. And I think that a lot could be learned from other cities such as ours, Everett, God bless them. I just don't see that Everett has a, uh, uh, they have a shoreline, of course, but they don't have that lake in the middle of their city that people want to come and spend a week there. Again, don't get mad at me if you're from Everett, but um, I think that there could be a lot learned by gleaning information of what has been done right and wrong in other like communities such as ours. Thank you, Commissioner Oxford. Um, unless any other commissioner has any questions, I think Jill, we're ready for the next next question. Unless you have some follow up questions to anything that the commissioners have uh, brought forth, I, I just would like to add, if, if I can, here I, I would tend to agree with Commissioner Welch. Um, you know, we are tasked with this process, and if there are stakeholders who feel that they would like something brought to our attention, you know, we do have. This is a public forum. Um, you know, people are encouraged to participate in the process and come to comment periods and, and utilize those. Um, is it Commissioner Cronin, is it okay if I make a final oh, yes, comment please. for myself? Jump, jump um, right in. I, I love the idea that Commissioner Huxford mentioned of looking at comparable communities. And I just wanted to mention Lake Us, is it El Oswego? Oswego. Lake um, which was a community that when we were doing the, the downtown sub area planning was brought to our attention as a comparable um, community to ours um, in terms of being around a lake and having a similar size. So I thought that might be one to look at. Um, and I, I, I think I'm the standalone pro committee person, but I would just add that, yes, it's it's certainly our, our task to dive into these issues and, and invite community comment. But I've just been really feeling like it's lacking right now during COVID with the, the virtual um, so uh, way that we do our meetings. And I just don't know that we get enough community input other than anecdotally with the people that we know. Um, so that's, that's just my take on it is just trying to dig a little deeper in what the community wants. But, um, but I do take it as a point. Well, it's a point well taken that, you know, it's up to us to really evaluate it. And responding to Commissioner Davis, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty familiar with the Lake Oswego regulations. It was a neighboring city of the last city that I worked at. Uh, we had updated ours a little bit before them, but I was familiar with some of the changes that they made to their um, regulations regarding short-term rentals. So I think that is a, a pretty good comparison. I think that short-term rentals, I mean, it, it becomes an issue in a lot of it's definitely popular in places like Lake Oswego and Lake Stevens, where you have that central lake. It also, you know, it becomes different issues based on the characteristics of that city. Like Hood River, Oregon has basically had a short-term rental crisis because it's completely impacted housing affordability for long-term residents because everybody finds out that they can rent their house for three or four months in the spring and summer and make more money than they can, you know, in 12 months for a long-term rental. And so, um, we want to definitely use some some research that we do in other communities, but Lake Stevens is unique, so we'll de we'll definitely kind of use those best practices and and see what we can uh, um, kind of glean from there. Thank you. Um, again, I I differ on unique. I don't think we're that unique. I I I think that people are needing to pay their property taxes here just like they do everywhere else. So. Anyway, we'll see where this goes. This, this will be interesting. I don't know where I fall on it for the record. Thank you everyone for your comments. Um, Planner Needham, I think we're ready for the next question. Okay, um, so should short-term rentals continue to be allowed only on owner-occupied sites? I'll jump in here. I'm sorry. I'm kind of, I'm kind of in Commissioner Huxford's boat. When I was reading all this, I didn't see, like I saw, I think the city does have to, you know, need, they can't walk the fence really with this issue. Like a lot of the stuff about serving dinner, you know, the guests and, you know, getting specific like that. Um, 
you know, obviously that can be greatly updated, but I'm not sure where I fall overall on it. So I have trouble kind of, uh, you know, providing a lot of value for you at this stage. So I, I apologize for not having a full opinion on it, but, you know, I'm not sure exactly uh, kind of the pros and cons to allowing, um, you know, uh, requiring it to be owner occupied solely. Do any other commissioners have any other, you know, specific comments towards that? Uh, I had a question. I would just share. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. You, no, please, please go. Well, I would just share based on just experience. You know, I've I've stayed at both you know VRBO type places, and also at bed and breakfast. And you know, if if you're serving food, then I kind of consider you more a bed and breakfast, like an owner occupied, um, short term lodging type thing. Um, I would I would be interested in in uh, looking at that from both directions. Um, I've stayed at ones that don't have owners on site, haven't had a problem there, um, but I'd love to hear what the rest of the commission thinks on the subject. My question had to do with the, um, I, that you answered partly already, which is whether ADUs count as owner occupied um, for the purposes of the code. And um, I was wondering if, and you probably have, don't know, but I'm wondering if any of the uh, current um, houses have ADUs on their property. I don't even know if that if that's a if you have that information. It's it, it, it's interesting to me that fact. Yeah. So um, roughly thirty percent are probably ADUs just by the looks of the listings. Um, and that is, that would be allowable since it is an owner occupied site. Again, I'll just pipe up that um, Manson specifically is um, not requiring that the owners be on site, but that there is a liability to the owner if anything happens or if the police are having to be utilized or if any security or safety is jeopardized for the existing residents in that area. So um, again, we could learn a lot from some of the people that have gone down this hole. This path, not this hole, this path. Thank you, Jill. I think we're ready for the next question. So should short-term rentals uh, within the waterfront residential zoning district have different regulations than the ones outside of the waterfront residential zoning district? Doesn't really seem fair. It's still just a room. <laughs> I would tend to agree with Commissioner Oslin. I think on the surface, I'd, I'd agree with both of them as well. And, and again, for me, it comes to kind of picking a side. I think the more, the more specific regulations you put on things, um, you know, the more there's going to be outliers. Like I think of traveling nurses, I think of a lot of different things that would, uh, you know, technically be outside of code or might be a reason for, uh, just more reasons for it to contradict the purpose of the code. Okay, any other comments on that one? Nope, okay. Um, so should the number of short-term rentals in the city be limited? I'll chime in and uh, say we should not limit it. We don't already have a very big market in the first place. It only about 26. When I checked Airbnb, I saw 26, roughly, give or take. I don't know if they were all in the city limits or not. That's not really a lot. When you look at other places like Chelan or even Lake, Lake Oswego, they have over 300. Each of those do. So that's where you, you would limit, I think, if you get a lot. But with our number, I don't think we even, we don't, we're not even really on the map when it comes to people wanting to uh, becoming a big hot spot, I would say, is how you want to say it. But, but, you know, due respect, um, every summer the call goes out for anybody willing to, to rent out just their dock. So every summer it is an all call. 
to see anybody that has any space on this lake that they can come and camp out for the next whatever three months and pay any money. One was downtown. We've had some on our end of the lake, but um, it's so yeah, we have that now. But kind of looking at the 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 vision, perhaps. Um, like I say, I don't know where I fall on this, but it'll be a curious conversation. And, and I, I tend to agree with both of those points, even though, you know, they weren't fully aligned. Um, but as far as to Commissioner Welch's point, I know there's 25 on site. Is there any data on, you know, how many have actually been rented out? Because um, that is one thing that I was thinking as I was reading all this is, you know, what, you know, what is the demand? Um, you know, obviously you want to get ahead of it, kind of like um, um, David was insinuating regarding housing affordability and the things that happened in the last place he worked at. Um, but I am really curious, you know, as this goes moves forward and I think more about it, you know, how big the market is and, um, you know, it's just, it's just something I'm curious about, I guess. So I went through Airbnb not too long ago, um, and I was kind of surprised at how um, booked some of them were, even this, no, this is kind of the, considered the off season. So a lot of them are fully booked through December, January. I think sometimes it shows booked though, and the owner's just not actually renting during that period of time. So in my experience with those things. Thank you. Um, does anybody else have any other um, questions for Planner Needham? All right, I guess we can move on to the next question. Okay, um, so should there be a limit on the amount of square footage used for short-term rentals? Yes, not to have a up oh, sorry go, go, go ahead Mr. Welch I, I'll just say no there should be none I mean if because who knows how big a certain house is I mean you can rent out the whole house should be fine and dandy I don't think it's real that big of a deal on how much you square footage you got and I would agree as long as everything's built to code and everything exists within existing code uh, you know whether it's a minimum or a maximum threshold that doesn't really make sense to me at that point I would tend to agree with Commissioner Doerr and Commissioner Welch. I think that also kind of goes with my other point where it, it'll lead to a bunch of outliers and, uh, you know, inst instances that contradict what the intended code, or the code is intended for. I also agree with that. And so do I. I agree. All right, Planner Needham, I think we're ready for the next one. Okay, um, so should owner-occupied sites continue to require an ACUP and should non-owner-occupied sites require ACUP? I, I would be curious what kind of the comparables out there um, would indicate in terms of best practice there. Um, I honestly don't know what the best option is. So I think I'd want to see what other municipalities have done um, with respect to this question. Yeah, absolutely. I haven't done quite a deep dive into other cities codes quite yet, but I do plan to in the future as we work through this code amendment. Um, so I'll definitely check out Manson. I'll check out Lake Oswego um, and a couple others and, and see kind of what they're doing. I would agree with uh, Commissioner Doerr. I'm, I'm not quite sure on that one either. I know we need to find some way to at least register these so they are um, known to the city, at least so we know what's going on. If only one so far, and we know there's at least 20 something, then that's, that's probably gonna be the biggest thing is how do we get these basically, they can say paperwork done to make sure there's proper liability insurance and all the other things. I guess that'd be the challenge for us is how we're going to, how is that going to get done at this point? I don't know. I don't know if the, if the, if the change in use would be, would help out with that or not, or what kind of documents we would need to get this started. 
Um, I guess I would ask the question, since it is a, a business generating idea, um, so do these guys have to register as a business with the Secretary of State or how, are they just doing this on the website on their own? Because I've, while I've used them, I've never obviously created one, so. Well, you don't need a business license to rent your house otherwise. I mean, I understand there's a business element, but I don't think they're registering with the state. Yeah, I would think if they have it in their, if the house is owned in their name, they wouldn't need a business license. Right. Well, I've never been a landlord, so I'm going to defer to everyone who's been one um, on how, then how is, because if you rent out your home as a landlord, you obviously are paying taxes, I'm going to guess, on everything. So how does that get sorted? The idea is, I guess, are we going to be, because I know it's one of the questions is going to be about hotels and stuff, because there is a, there's all taxes with the state and with us on hotels and motels. Would this be the same idea or not? I guess is what I'm looking for. That's, that's a great question. Oh, I'm sorry, Vicki, go ahead, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, if, if like uh, uh, Commissioner Cronin says, if it's your own home and you're renting it, you pay your federal taxes on that or the state taxes if you have it, it's income producing property, but it's not a business license. I would say too, I'm oh, sorry, somebody, but I was to Commissioner Welch's point though, if, if there's anybody, you know, if the worry here is that people are coming in from a business perspective and having just a long-term rental, you know, they're definitely going to, because putting an LLC separates the liability from you as an individual. Right. So definitely, you know, it's not, you can do it either way. I assume through Airbnb and all that stuff, but um, you know, if this becomes something where a ton flood the market or something like that, you know, a significant amount you'd think would be owned in LLCs. Um, but then again, you know, would they have a, yeah. I guess they'd need a city business license for that. That might be a question for the city. They definitely need a, you know, secretary of state business LLC formation and all that stuff. I mean, it's just, uh, I'm trying to figure out how we would then register these locations, what, what route we would take. Is it the last thing through the city? Is it through the, how the, you know, how do you tie that all together to create this almost like a database of these places so they can be inspected if need be? That way we know if they're rentals, so we know if they're not being occupied by the owner at times, or it's just uh, how are we going to go about getting that part done? I think that's going to be the most, the part I don't see where we're going to go with this yet. And, and tagging onto that, I think, you know, one of the things I, I saw in the presentation that is something that would probably require either at the um, council level or within a change in city policy that enforcement right now is only done on a complaint driven basis. And I think that there would have to be a more proactive approach um, to ensure that there's an even treatment of all these, all these properties, you know, once, once a decision is made. And Jill, all of these points that have just been brought up are points that I think that some cities that you've mentioned on this call that have been brought up on this call wish that they had gotten front of because once it becomes the wild west, it's really hard to pull back. There are houses that have been bought primarily, I mean, not even primarily, solely for this purpose. And now that they're going through this lottery system and this insurance system over in Chelan, there are people that can't afford to keep their homes because that is their business, right? They bought three of them or whatever and 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 they haven't grabbed the lottery. So now they, they are having to sell those. So I think that this conversation that just had all of the topics that came up are so important to get in front of prior to bringing this back. You can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. Yeah, and these are all, all great points and all great ideas from commissioners. We just staff definitely appreciates them. Uh, just to circle back on a, on a couple of topics, um, on the issue of the ACUP and the owner-occupied versus non-owner-occupied, I, I have done you know, a good amount of research in previous jobs when we were looking at changing regulations and a number of jurisdictions, especially throughout the Northwest have kind of differentiated between hosted and unhosted units and unhosted is typically called a vacation rental where you're basically renting out your whole property. You don't live there. It's not owner occupied either that or um, we actually saw a surprising number of school teachers that would like take off for the summer and then they'd rent out um, their homes over the summer while they were traveling. 
um, and they wouldn't have anyone living there. So it was considered a vacation rental that required a full blown CUP in the city where I worked. Whereas if you were just renting out rooms short term for a short term rental, you didn't need that conditional use permit. So we had slightly different procedures depending on what the characteristics of the short term rental were. Um, and just because the vacation rentals, obviously there was a lot more turnover, there was less oversight. Um, they were renting out the whole home and they were basically doing it for at least most of the spring and summer. Whereas the short term rentals, we had a limit on the number of days. Um, in exchange for that, you didn't have quite as onerous a land use approval process. Um, so there's, that's something that we can potentially look at, just how we treat hosted versus unhosted if, if commissioners are comfortable with, with having those unhosted rentals of the entire property. Um, and then on the inspections and kind of licensing, um, in most places I've seen just when you're first going through the land use approval or through whatever licensing approval, you are required to get an inspection done. Um, that's primarily focused, a lot of times that's focused on two things, parking, just to make sure that there's adequate parking on the site. And the second is from a life and safety perspective, uh, primarily to make sure that there's legal egress, especially when you have people that maybe aren't super familiar with the property. You wanna make sure that you have adequate number of windows and, and doors and just that you meet the fire code and the building code. So I think that's definitely something that we can look at as far as maintaining a, a safe and healthy environment uh, for people that are operating short-term rentals. Uh, so those are just a couple items I wanted to touch on. Again, in my experience over, over on the east side is that it's um, parking, noise, and the um, strain that it puts on the local police department. Those are the three things that keep coming up over and over and over again. One thing that... Um, that, that David mentioned that I that I think might help simplify things, or I'd at least be interested in seeing kind of it further along, would be to break it up into two. I think if you differentiated the two types of rentals, then it might make the rest of the regulation a lot simpler behind it. Um, again, I'm kind of talking early and before I really know my direction on everything, but um, you know that did that is something that I think might uh, you know help help the regulation work um, for all sides. Yeah, and a lot of cities have done that. Um, I think Spokane is an example. They split theirs into type A and type B, whereas type Bs are the whole home rentals, and those require a little bit more of a stringent um, approval process. All right, Jill, I think we're ready for the next, next question. Um, so are the parking requirements that are listed in table 14721 appropriate um, for short-term rentals, tourist homes? Um, so they would be treated as the same as hotels and motels. Do, do any commissioners have any opinion on this for Planner Needham? Oh, again, I'd like to see what comps have in their in their programs. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Commissioner Doerr. My my sentiment exactly. So currently, um, the requirement is they have to have one space per each room rented, plus an additional um, for whatever other facilities are on site. So um, I take that to mean that if it's an occupied structure um, with an owner that, that lives there, they'd have to have the two spaces for the owner and then any additional parking spaces for each room that they rent. But who is monitoring that? If I can't, if I can't park in my own driveway because the person next door has rented out their house and they have, you know what I mean? I just, again, this is one of the things that comes up a lot is, um, and every week it changes. So you have to teach a whole new group of people um, because it's not owner occupied. Just that's where I think that comps from other places, what they have learned 
um, by going down this, this path for a while would be hugely helpful for us. Yes, and I would, and to, to, to that point too, I would think about like on Vernon Road, I just had a project on Vernon Road and just having any sub, you know, you need to find places to park. So I can't imagine an Airbnb there with the limited street parking, you know, it definitely, you know, you definitely get some complaint calls. And then you add in boat trailers and then you add it, you know, it's, yeah, it gets complicated. Any other comments on parking for planner need him? Do we have any kind of numbers on the amount of complaints or what type of complaints we've had so far with the current market and the current homes that we have today? So Dave, maybe you can speak more on this, but since I've been here, I've received two that we have taken care of. Yeah, I haven't been consulted on any of the calls that uh, potentially came through code enforcement. Um, so I don't know if that is just speaks to that it went to another planner um, or that we just haven't had a whole lot as far as the volume of these calls. Um, you know, if, if we'd had a lot, I probably would have been consulted at some point. I haven't heard any in the last few months at least, um, but that also could be a product of the time of year. Could we get a list of the complaints and what type of complaints they were just so that we can get a general idea of what the community is perceiving the problems to be? Yeah, we can consult with the, with the building and code enforcement team with NG and then with uh, Nick and Tyler, who were in that role prior to her arrival, um, to see kind of what the scale and the scope of that is, just to kind of ascertain how big of an issue is this. I don't think that we've gotten a ton of complaints um, and a ton of code enforcement cases, but we'll definitely, we can research that before we bring it back. Great, thanks. And some of those cities, again, that we've been mentioning have those stats. I, I don't know them off the top of my head, but I've heard that they are keeping stats on that. Thank you. And unless any other commissioners have any other questions, uh, Jill, I think we're ready for the last question. Okay. Last one, um, should weddings, conferences, or other large gatherings be allowed on some sites? Well, if there's an issue with parking, how could you have a large conference or a wedding? I mean, where would people park? So obviously some sites are not the same as others. The one that Commissioner um, Cronin was talking about on Vernon probably would not be appropriate for a large gathering with no parking. Um, but there are some larger properties in the city that they that may be a possibility. So they would actually have room for the parking. Um, if you had it, then it would be okay. But if you didn't have room for the parking, then it wouldn't make sense to have a, a big wedding or a conference because where would people exactly. park? Yeah. I've, I've attended events where there's um, shuttle parking to get to, you know, offsite parking with shuttles that will bring people in. Um, so I could see that happening if we were, if the city were to allow events like that, but I, I, ha I have, I have a hesitation about it just because these um, properties are embedded in residential neighborhoods and that if, if we're already worrying about noise um, or other nuisance complaints, then having a big event might, um, exclusive of the topic of parking, it might cause more problems than it's worth. And having done events before you really do, that is where you need to get in with a business license and a liquor license if you're choosing to do that and all of the other things to go, you know, holding a certain amount of liability and everything else. So I think that's, that's a different, again, to John's point earlier, that's a different topic. That's, that's another segment. Yeah, and I agree with that too. I would say for that, it would be a, you know, conditional use permit. And then some for, you know, for each specific event, you wouldn't want to just open up the floodgates to, you know, people to be able to try to have conferences on odd shaped lots and houses and things like that. I mean, once you enter into these kind of larger events per se, I mean, you enter a lot of other issues. I mean, you're talking about bringing in the health district and that kind of stuff due to other facilities, we'll say, and other reason so i mean those are kind of complicated to be involved i think in this 
don't think that should even be in this ordinance when it comes through. That would be something totally separate, I would think. I, I agree. I think in my neighborhood or the graduation parties and two weddings this year, and it just goes on. This isn't the same as the renting out the room, but that stuff happens on its own. So I, I wouldn't mix it up with this. I agree completely on that. I actually, I agree with both of the, all three of those commissioners as well. Um, do any other, before Jill gets her closing thoughts here, does anybody have any other comments or questions for her? All right, thank you, Jill. Right, Jill, do you have everything or do, would you like to have any last thoughts or questions for any of the commission before we move on? Um, I do not. I do have some research ahead of me. So next time we will come back with some more specific research um, to share with the commission. Dave, did you have anything you wanted to add? I appreciate all the feedback and uh, look forward to working on this and utilizing the commission's knowledge. Are we in agreement then that this is going to stay in our in our court and that we're going to handle it ourselves? I I agree with that. Yeah, I do too. I I would support that. Yes. If you're waiting for my comment, should we do any research or should staff do any reach out to current? homes that are using these, that are being used as vacation rentals or short-term rentals to get any input from them on how they've already been doing business or does that matter? Or, I mean, we're gonna do public outreach no matter what. So I guess that would fall under that. So for, scratch that, I'm talking out loud. Yeah, I think that was generally some of the thought on, on some of the potential focus groups or direct outreach to, to property owners that are either currently doing it or interested or just happen to live along the lake and have thought about it. We would probably put out, you know, a call through a variety of different media, um, you know, social media, um, city websites, just to say, hey, we're looking at kind of different thoughts and opinions on this. So. All right. Well, thank you. Appreciate, appreciate all the feedback. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry for leaving you hanging there. Um, oh, oh, well, with that, I think, uh, and then to Commissioner Welch's point too, um, Senior Planner um, Levitan, um, if it could be just known that we do, that the Planning Commission did, you know, state that they would like to, you know, that, that they question the need for a, a committee and, and, you know, are, are up for the task of, of taking this on themselves. All right, great. Well, thank you, Chair Cronin. Uh, and then lastly, and I, I'm assuming, David, that you're, you are giving us the work print. I don't see Russ in here. So with that, we're on to the next discussion item. Um, and I'm going to pass it on to uh, Senior Planner Levitan for the 2022 work program. Yeah, so thank you, Chair Cronin. So yeah, Russ has uh, had a conflict tonight, has uh, Snohomish County tomorrow. The steering committee is considering the um, the next, the 2044 growth target tonight, um, which would then be forwarded on the, to the county council. So I'm just going to provide a really brief overview. Um, so each year we develop a long range work program um, that covers things like code amendments, the comp plan docket, kind of all the long range stuff that doesn't have to do with general land use um, applications. Um, so we develop that, we solicit feedback from the planning commission, we present it to the city council who then approves that and that basically drives the department's long range planning efforts over the year. Um, so in your staff report, there's just a kind of a brief overview of the 2021 work program, what was completed. Um, we, um, City Council adopted uh, seven code amendments. So seven ordinances to modify uh, either Title 14 or Title 16 or Title 17. Um, had the, 20, the 2021 comp plan docket, um, 
Planning Commission has issued their recommendation. That's going to be considered by the City Council in a couple of weeks. And then the department also processed two annexations, the Machias Industrial Annexation, um, and then the Southeast Interlocal Annexation. So as we move into 2022, there are a number of items that were identified on the 2021 work program that are that we're carrying over into 2022, just that we didn't have time to get to. Um, so a couple of those we've already talked about. We've obviously talked about short-term rentals tonight. Um, the park impact fee review was something that originally we had planned on doing this year, but we wanted to do some additional research. So uh, the city council ended up um, based on the planning commission's recommendation only amending uh, the impact fee code as it relates to schools and to traffic. So we did do those and now we're looking at doing some additional amendments on the parks mitigation side of things. Um, there are a number of kind of just general housekeeping, general code cleanup things that as planners we see um, and kind of maybe don't warrant their own specific code amendment, but kind of administrative issues, housekeeping issues that we've been keeping an inventory of that we'd like to get to just because they're it's getting to be a little bit of a bigger list and we definitely want to tackle those. So that's something that we're proposing doing this year. Um, let me scroll on down. Um, kind of another couple, there's kind of similar to that is uh, kind of a review of our process code um, for different types of land use review, um, noticing requirements, publishing requirements, um, kind of that's in a lot of different places right now and it can be kind of hard to follow for applicants. And so we want to try to streamline that and consolidate that as much as possible. So we think that's an important code amendment for this year. Um, tiny houses and micro housing is another item that was included in on the 2021 work program. It's, um, you know, it's an issue of housing affordability. It's an issue, issue of land use. It's an issue kind of, of compatibility. So that's something that we want to look at to try to be proactive on that. We haven't really seen that yet in Lake Stevens, but starting, you know, obviously I've seen it in Seattle, started to see it in Everett. Um, and so we think, you know, we'd like to develop some, some regulations related to that and, and look at a code amendment related to that. Um, and then there are a couple of items um, from the permissible uses work that uh, the city council just adopted. Um, the city council wanted to have a uh, more detailed discussion of some of the potential amendments as it relates to storage facilities. So uh, when they adopted that ordinance and considered the planning commission's recommendation, um, they, their motion um, was to approve it, but without any changes to the storage facilities code. So we're proposing to do that as a standalone amendment. Um, I think we've already done a, a fair amount of research, so I, I don't think it'll be super detailed, but we, we still think it's something that, that, you know, would warrant some additional analysis and some additional research. So that's something that we're looking to do as part of the 2022 work program. And then there are kind of the last three, that, last three or four that are listed um, on the second page of the staff reports are tree retention, the stormwater manual, mixed use regulations and our streets and sidewalk code. I think a lot of those are kind of as time allows the stormwater manual, we are planning on adopting the 2019 manual for Western Washington. And um, I've consulted with our um, surface water coordinator and there are a couple other items that are required by state law that we need to adopt an ordinance related to that. So I, I think we're gonna have some help from her on that um, and we'll help to facilitate that code amendment and then there are kind of just a couple of general topics such as tree retention, mixed use regulations and the street and sidewalk code. I think as we administer, especially more infill developments, we've identified some, um, you know, issues with our, our tree code that's, you know, could definitely be smoothed out. We could provide a little bit more clarity. Um, and so we want to look at without you know, I, th I think at this point, without specific direction from the city council on the on the scope of that, we definitely are going to get their feedback on that. I, I think we're not looking at a gigantic overhaul to it. We're looking at ways to simplify and streamline and to make it more logical. But we definitely want to get feedback from from planning commissioners and on that. And we'll also be asking uh, city council members just as far as you know what whether they would like to look at that and what the scope of that would be. So. 
Those, that's kind of an overview of the code amendments. Um, the, the 2022 comp plan docket we anticipate to be relatively minor. As we look forward to the 2024 major updates, um, we're not planning on doing any kind of major amendments to any of the uh, any of the uh, comp plan elements in the next few years, just because we're going to basically do kind of do a complete rewrite of the of the comp plan uh, leading into 2024. Um, so there are a couple items um, where we've gotten some state funding, especially um, as was noted at a previous meeting, we have gotten $100,000 from the Department of Commerce to work on a housing action plan. So we anticipate doing a lot of that kind of technical and research work in 2022, which will then lead up to an update to the housing element as part of the 2024 update. Uh, so we are looking at doing that. We just received notice um, that we got a $30,000 grant from the Department of Ecology um, to help develop some user's guides and do kind of an inventory of the lake as far as kind of non-conforming situations, just to try to see as we look at updating the SMP and trying to provide more clarity, especially as it relates to non-conforming situations, kind of what are some of the common situations that we run into and what would be a way that we could amend the SMP to make it a little bit easier to go through the permitting process. So that's something that we're looking at doing in 2022. Um, and then kind of there's some infrastructure analysis that definitely needs to be done. We've talked about this a little bit. So the city council has talked about it at a number of meetings, especially within the expanded industrial area. Um, now that we've kind of gone, um, had the Machias annexation, um, there are definitely some infrastructure constraints that are limiting um, redevelopment and general development within the area that given that that area is identified as a major source of employment growth in the city. Um, we'd like to get really into the nuts and bolts of how we can make that, um, you know, uh, better accommodate the needed employment growth that we have over the next couple of decades. So that's, that's going to be a major focus. It's a kind of a several, several different departments are going to work on that. Um, so yeah, those are a couple of the items. So I wanted to get general feedback from commissioners. Are there any additional items that you'd like to have added to the work program for us to recommend to the city council? Um, and yeah, I'm just happy to discuss kind of anything on there or anything additional that you wanna talk about. Thank you, Senior Planner Levitan. Uh, does it, do any commissioners have any questions or I guess comments on the 2021 overview or moving forward on the uh, 2022 work program? Um, yeah, uh, from my from my perspective, uh, I just want to, I guess, thank the city. I thought we did a pretty good job in 2021. It's kind of unprecedented territory, but um, it seems, you know, I think the city's got a good handle on um, the Zoom meetings and getting things accomplished. Um, the only thing I, I guess, the only criticism I would have is when we spent a long time, I felt, you know, on a particular building for the marijuana regulations and, you know, we're meeting twice a month for that. Um, you know, I think maybe we could have knocked a couple more things off, but again, I commend the city for doing what they're doing. And, um, you know, I look forward to 2022. I have a quick question. When it comes to the towny, tiny, town, tiny houses uh, discussion we'll end up having, um, is that separate from our regular zoning on how many, I don't see how that, I guess I'm, I don't want to get into the debate obviously yet, but, uh, how that, where that would fall in our, you know, I guess I can wait because I, I don't have the question form yet. Yeah, that's one that we definitely need to think about in the, in the scope of that and really what we're trying to get at. And uh, a lot of it has to do with dealing with state regulations around them and how they're treated um, by, you know, by different state agencies. And there's been a whole lot of work done on that, but there still is some ambiguity as far as how, whether, you know, whether they're on wheels, whether they need to be on a full foundation. So it's trying to kind of take all of that stuff at the state level and kind of codify it at the local level and, um, you know, kind of 
Uh, so that'll that'll be you know an interesting one. So. And then on that note, would micro housing also include like in Seattle, you know, the where there's four units to share like a living room, kind of like a college quarter, you know, it's more like a multifamily house or is this micro housing, as you said, more the smaller, smaller stuff or is it all encompassing? Yeah, so I think when you use the term micro housing, it's more like um, kind of the, the former where it's, you know, several units is kind of almost more like uh in a way it can be like a boarding house or it can be like a dorm. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, the stuff that you see off of I-5 at, like in the U district and um, kind of some of those newer buildings. Um, and so, yeah, that's something that we would want to explore and, um, you know, kind of obviously kind of discuss um, with the community and with the planning commission and with the city council, just kind of what that would look like. But um, that's what the term usually covers and so we don't really have an idea of what that would look like i think we've focused more on the tiny homes but that's kind of a lot of those issues you tend to try to handle them hand in hand so we want to get some some good direction on that yeah i think and i think that'll be interesting i look forward to that conversation i will say one thing about seattle is seattle implemented a lot of that my, my brother actually builds those but but um there was loopholes where they you they wouldn't require parking like for instance in east lake and all these things and it was trying to be incentivized for people to ride the bus and things like that, but it definitely, you know, led to a change in the neighborhood. Maybe that was inevitable in Seattle with how dense it is. And, you know, the rural neighborhoods are kind of going out the window anyway, but obviously that's something that I'm sure the city will greatly think about, but that parking issue is, is definitely something with micro that, you know, it'd be interesting to see how it'd be implemented in Lake Stevens. I just have a quick question. Do you have any idea when the shoreline master program was going to be addressed. We're carrying that over. We ran out of time this year. That's a big topic. And that is one that um, kind of got to uh, Chair Cronin's point, kind of got waylaid with our focus being directed for so long elsewhere this year. Yeah, so that's something that we want to start right up, you know, already kind of working on some of the logistics of that. And, um, you know, we're, we're currently working on some of the some of the research now. So that's that's something we definitely want to complete in 2022. Um, I think we're going to bring that back to the city council and just, you know, the scope of that can be super minor. It can focus on, you know, standardizing some of the non-conforming situation language. It can be on kind of essentially codifying or at least putting into the SMP some of the uh, recommendations from the Waterfront Residential Task Force or it can be larger. Um, so I think it depends on ultimately what the scope is. So we'll, we'll bring that back um, probably at the, the first meeting in January, just so we can kind of establish that scope and you know establish a schedule based on, on where the planning commission and where the city council would like to go. But at this point, we see it as a, a relatively limited amendment that we could definitely do, um, try to do in the first probably six to nine months, um, just, um, because there is kind of on the Department of Ecology side, there is some um, public outreach and noticing requirements and all of that that kind of just automatically adds several months to the process. So we want to get through some of the content, but we also want to solicit as much input from uh, property owners um, and residents as well um, as possible. So we'll, we'll definitely, it sounds like, you know, we've heard about this from a couple of different commissioners. I, th I think that's something that we'll want to bring back to that first meeting of January with a better idea of a schedule and a scope. Thank you. And, and Senior Planner Levitan, is, uh, I heard you mentioned the January meeting. Um, are we meeting in December, on the second week of December? Uh, we do not have anything identified for the second meeting of December. So unless you'd unless you really miss each other, uh, we probably don't need to hold that meeting. We'll make you be there too. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we don't have anything and um, yeah, no, we definitely, we just, just looking through the list and I mean, that's a, a number of these items as several of you have pointed out, it uh, took several meetings. And so we appreciate your efforts this year. And there was a big stretch where we were meeting both meetings for several months in a row. And, um, you know, so they weren't exactly optional meetings. Um, and so, uh, no, we appreciate your efforts. Thank you. We appreciate it. 
If this is going to be the last one. meeting of the year, um, Chair Cronin, nicely done. And for the meetings that you were unavailable, Commissioner Welch, uh, the two of you are a, a dream team. You handled this year really, really well. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Does anybody else have any other closing comments uh, to Senior Planner Levitan before we move out of the discussion items? All right, Senior Planner Levitan, am I right to assume you're you're good to go? Yeah, we're we're good. Thank you, Chair Cronin. All right, thank you. And with that, I, we'll move on to the commissioner reports. Um, so I'll start with Commissioner Huxford. Two different people have asked, and I keep forgetting to ask you, what is going in in the building that's being built where the old red barn used to be on 91st and 204? Remind me. It, are you asking Senior Planner Levitan or me? I'm asking anybody that can answer. Uh, two different people asked like in the past 24 hours. Car wash. I cannot remember. Car wash, yeah. Car wash. Got it, it's thanks. Like an, an expensive car wash too, from a building perspective. Yeah. Is that is that it for your report, Commissioner? That's it. That's, thank you. Merry Christmas, all. <laughs> that was it. Uh, Commissioner Door, Commissioner Report. There it is. Uh, I don't have anything to report. Just want to say thank you all for the the great year. Commissioner Osland. Uh, no report, but thank you to staff. Uh, great reports as usual and all year long. Thank you. Commissioner Holt. Um, no, I just wanted to say thank you to everybody and everybody have a great holiday. And Commissioner Davis. I echo the thanks and the well wishes. And um, yeah, I have no other report. Uh, the same for me. Thank you to everybody from the city to every, all the commissioners. Uh, you know, I know it's a time commitment and all that. Um, and I, and I appreciate it. Um, so anyway, with that, I think we're good to go. So I'd like to make a motion to close the planning commission meeting for December 1st, 2021. Do I have second. a second? All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. We are closed. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Bye.